Hello and welcome once again to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelny, the instructor this term. We are now at the halfway point in our adventure together, which means uh, about this week you will find a midterm exam available to you in uh, Angel. In that midterm exam, you will be given a random game to play. Uh, Angel will randomly assign you to play some game maker game that somebody has published out there. And you will play that game, and then you will answer some questions about it as part of your exam. So did you ever believe you would be taking an exam that included playing a computer game? Life is good. OK. This week's lecture, we are back in Game Design Workshop. We are working on, uh, in this latest edition, it is Chapter 9 on playtesting today. What is playtesting? Has anybody, just out of curiosity, a show of hands, anyone in this room been a playtester for a published commercial game? Playtester or beta tester, they're, they're not the same. Okay, we have a couple of hands. We have, actually, almost half the students are putting up their hands here in the classroom. So you may have some experience with beta testing or play testing. We will talk today about what the difference is between those things and many other exciting topics. OK, yes, this term, you will do the midterm and this week, midterm and play testing. Very exciting week. Next week, an even more exciting week in lab, we will do physical prototyping, which means I will bring in my toy box and we will play with toys in class. Uh, that is often a student's favorite week of the year. Okay, previously we said that a game designer must be an advocate for the player and that a, we're going to say a good way to learn these skills is to be a play tester. That was in one of the early lectures we had talking about, I think it was the first day, what it is to be a game designer. And a good way to get those skills is to be a play, to let, be a play tester. So today we shall discuss that topic for you. What? is this thing we call playtesting. Well, playtesting is not the same as game designing. It's not the same as coming up with the ideas for the game. Something should be designed before any playtesting takes place. Now, you can playtest a prototype of a game. In fact, you should playtest any prototype of a game that you create. But it has to actually have been created before you can playtest it. Seems kind of obvious, huh? Well, playtesting is not the same as debugging either. Um, you can playtest a game that has bugs, or you can playtest a game that has no bugs. Um, that it is has not really related to finding and solving bugs in the game. And you can debug a game without doing any playtesting. Some people use mathematical models to debug, in fact. All right, so what is playtesting? It is not the same as beta testing. Oh, we got Plants vs. Zombies playing there. Great. All right, a game should have been play tested long before it reaches the beta stage. If you have beta testers playing your game, the fun should already be built into that game. People should already have concluded, hey, this game is kind of fun. If you're beta testing a game and it's not fun, they probably skipped the play testing stage. Now, playtesting is, in fact, playing a game. It may be enjoying that game. It may be enjoying the game immensely, but playtesting can also be hating the game. You may be playtesting a game that has no fun whatsoever built into it, and that is what the game designer needs to find out. And here's a quote from me. Playtesting is the best process we have for finding what is fun and not fun about a game. You can do a lot of things to try to find that out, but playtesting is the best. Let's talk about why you should playtest it. Well, you're a game designer. You can playtest your own game, right? You can tell if it's fun, right? Well, there's a problem with that. The problem is that fun is an opinion. It requires human judgment. If you are harnessing the judgment of the game designer, you have just one human's judgment being applied to determine whether or not that is fun. All right, another reason why you should get play testers. Let's say this curve describes the universe of game players and their skill. So there are 
Not many game players who have no experience playing games, but there are some that are just starting out. The more experience you get, the more likely it is you'll have a lot of game players, and there will be this large population in the middle of game players who have a medium amount of playing experience, and then there will be way out here the really, really hardcore game players with huge amounts of experience. There will be some of the elite game players way out here on the end of this continuum. Everyone kind of understand how this bell curve, what this bell curve is telling you about the skill of game players and the experience of game players? Well, game developers tend to be way out here with the elite game players. They have tons and tons of game experience. So if you have nothing but game developers do your play testing, you will probably be developing a game that is only good for elite gamers. You won't be addressing most of the game players of the world. That's why you can get play testers from all over the place. Now, there is such a thing as self-testing. You will, in fact, play all the games that you create, I hope. You do that in this class, right? Yeah, I know some of you haven't played the games you turn into me. Now and then I get a game that definitely you turned it in and you didn't play it. Most of the time, though, the games are good and playable, and I can tell you played the games. But please, from now on, play those games before you turn them in. All right. You will find the opinions of others to be valuable when you do this, and I'm hoping that you will get some of your games play-tested in this class by your peers. There is a downside of self-testing, and that is you often cannot see your own faults. Your ideas may be fun, your ideas may be wonderful, but your idea of fun may not be shared by every game player who would like to play your game. You can use friends as play testers, and most game designers do at some point turn to their friends and say, hey, play this game, tell me what you think. And the upside is they can play early versions of the game and give you feedback, and they will be understanding of what your vision is, much more than just the general public would. The downside is you cannot rely on the objectivity of your very best friends. When they play test your game, they may tell you it is more awesome than it really is. All right, so eventually you must play test with strangers. And the question is, whom should you get to be the strangers who play your game? Where can you find them? Well, your book has some ideas for you. You can get people from all walks of life, anyone who could be the target audience of your game, you should try to get to play test your game. Now, you can find play testers at community organizations sometimes. In fact, oddly enough, your textbook recommends finding a local community college campus as a great way to get uh, play testers for your games. And I bet all of you know where you can get access to one of those. Now, when you got these hordes rushing to play test your game, who should you accept as play testers? Believe it or not, you don't want just every person in the world to play test your game. There are some reasons why. First of all, you do not need the very best game players, as we saw with our bell curve there. Um, maybe a few of the elite game players would be good play testers, but you don't want lots of them in your pool of play testers. Skill can be nice. Very skilled game players, a few of them can give you feedback that you might not get otherwise. But you mostly need play testers who can articulate well. When you ask them, did you like the game? And they say, yes, you have not gotten much feedback from them. You need somebody who can give more than one word answers and explain what they're thinking, what they're feeling, how the experience is affecting them emotionally when they play your game. You see, they don't just experience your game, they tell you about that experience. And it's possible that if you get the most elite game player in the world, they may not have the best communication skills. And they might just say, it's good, or something like that. You want somebody that can give lots of self-expression. 
So who should you accept as you're making your phone calls and uh, recruiting your players? Well, a playtester who can't hold a coherent phone conversation, who is pretty bad with words and not able to talk to you very clearly is not going to be a good playtester. They will be useless. No matter how much, how skilled they are at playing games, even if he has mad skills. All right, diversity is really good. You should try for a cross-section of your target audience for the game. So if your game should apply to college student age people, then getting college students is probably a good idea. If you want it, your game to appeal to housewives, getting housewives is a good idea. If you want college student housewives, you can find those too. All right, let's talk about conducting a play testing session. So you've got your play testers picked out. First, you should introduce the game to them. Get them in a room, in a, a classroom type of room is pretty good for this, where you can make a little few minutes of presentation to them, introducing the game. Then you conduct a play test session. Have them play the game and tell them they will be watched while they are playing the game. Observe them and make notes. See what happens. If you can, uh, then you should have a warm-up discussion with your players. Have them talk to you about, well, what are your favorite games? And why do you like those games? Things like that. Get them started talking about describing games and get their words flowing before you try to get feedback about your game. When you observe the gameplay, probably start with 15 or 20 minutes. Ask the play testers to think out loud as they are playing. Express what's going on in their minds as they play your game. And if you can get a one-way mirror, like you see on all those detective interrogation shows, get a one-way mirror so they can't tell what you're looking at. They know you're watching them, but they can't tell what you're seeing. And, oh, here we have a, uh, a play test session you can observe where we recorded uh, actually some earlier students from this class. And uh, what do we observe in the playing of these students here through our uh, supposed one-way mirror? Anybody got one observation you can throw out that you saw there? Yeah, they seemed to be having fun. They seemed to be enjoying themselves getting along pretty well with their fellow game players. OK. Then, after they're done playing, have them discuss the experience. This should be another probably 15 or 20 minutes. Ask first for voluntary feedback. Before you even throw any specific questions out there, say, what did you think of the game? Volunteer anything you've got to say. And then ask some probing questions. Ask some questions that are going to get at what you are concerned about in your game. You should have questions prepared, like what were your overall thoughts about the game? Could you learn this game quickly? What did you like about this game? And what did you dislike about this game? And what was confusing to you about this game? All of these questions come from a list in your book, and there are many, many more questions uh, in your book that you can refer to. They're excellent. And when I uh, have you turn in, and some of you have already turned in the assignment where you develop your own playtesting questions, you can use some of these questions. They're perfectly fine. All right. It's possible your playtesters will be reluctant to speak. But you, as the game designer, you must still discover the truth. So you've got to get answers out of them. Don't let them worry about protecting your feelings. You've got to have a oh, tough skin, or a thick skin, as it's sometimes said. Be prepared for harsh criticism from your play testers. It's okay. You are, after all, an artist. If you're a game creator, you must become used to criticism. There will always be someone who will criticize your game, no matter what it is. I bet you can take the most fun game you've ever played in your life and find things you could say critical about that game. Expect your play testers to do the same thing to your game. It's okay. If you're a poet, you get used to people criticizing your poetry. If you're a novelist, you get used to people criticizing your novels. If you're a filmmaker, you get used to people criticizing your films. 
And when you're a game designer, you had better get used to people criticizing your games. Probably the first time you're going to experience that is during a play test session of one of your first games. Possibly even today in this class. All right, one useful discussion tool pointed out by your book is called the Play Matrix. It is a grid of four boxes where you can graph the characteristics of a game based on how much physical challenge it offers, how much mental challenge it offers, how much skill it requires versus how much luck it requires. Let's give some examples of putting things on the play matrix. Basketball has a whole lot of skill involved and a whole lot of physical involved. There's not that much mental, not like chess, say, much more physical and very skill-based, not a whole lot of luck involved in basketball. Whereas uh, card game, let's say bridge, very highly mental, um, and very a huge amount of skill required, some luck, but in bridge, skill is extremely important. Even if you get dealt bad hands of cards, if you are a skilled player, you can drive down your opponents and defeat them. Then there's a dice game like craps. When you're shooting craps, luck is tremendously important. There's very little skill involved, very little physical involved. Some mental involved in the decision making, yes, but not a lot of physical skill. So it's up in that corner. And finally, an example of one that is, uh, has a lot of luck and a lot of physical. There aren't many games like this, but your book pointed this one out, Whack-A-Mole. Whack-A-Mole has luck and physical skill involved with it, but it doesn't have a lot of mental calculation. And uh, it's, that's, that one is kind of missing from the, that game. All right, now. Let's look at Evil Clutches, a game you made in this class. There's a good bit of luck involved in that since the releasing of babies and firing of demons at you uh, is totally random, based on a random number generator. And there is some physical skill, little bit of mental skill involved in that game. That's where I place Evil Clutches on this matrix. All right, Galactic Mail. I would put right in the middle, um, slightly toward the mental. You have some physical skills required. There is some luck involved as the asteroids and moons all move in a random direction. And uh, the physical controls, it's, it's got a balance of all of these things in that game, I believe. Whereas Koala Break, a uh, game that's coming in this, uh, this week, probably. Um, not a fast action game, it's a puzzle game. Extremely high mental. Some, a little bit of physical controls and timing with the moving saws and things like that. But mostly it's puzzling out it, the consequences. If I move the koalas this way, what will happen to all the koalas everywhere on the board at any moment? Not much luck. There's nothing random happening in Koala Break as it's designed. It's pretty much all solving this puzzle. Any questions about uh, where I'm putting these games on the matrix? OK. Now, let me ask you, where would baseball fit on this matrix? Do you think it is more physical or mental? Do you think it's more skill or more luck? Any thoughts, physical versus mental, in the classroom here? Probably toward the physical? Yeah, I'd agree with that in baseball. How about skill versus luck? Do you need skill to play baseball? Is there some luck involved in baseball? Maybe some. So perhaps it would go there. Strongly toward the physical. Some mental thoughts involved there. There is some strategy to baseball. Little bit of luck, but mostly the players need to have skill. And that's where I would put baseball. That's probably where you would put it if you uh, were asked this on a midterm exam, for example. How about Tetris? Where do you think Tetris would go on this matrix? Is it 
High physical skills or high mental skills? Yeah, it's probably more in the mental skills. How about skill versus luck? Is there luck involved in Tetris? There is some luck involved. The next piece to drop is randomly selected in that game. Is there skill involved also? Yes, you need to have both skill and luck. It's kind of a puzzle game like uh, Koala Braid is, but it's a puzzle game with a very strong random factor to it. So it would probably go here. That's where I'd say it's kind of between mental and physical, but much more toward the mental. Yeah, your, your fingers have to be really good at uh, hitting the right thing at the right time. You have to be quick sometimes. And there's, there is luck involved. You can't put it all the way on that side, but it, I think it's more mental, more puzzle solving and thinking ahead than it is luck by a little bit. It's a little bit on that side of the middle, I'd say. Okay, data gathering when you're play testing. A Likert scale can be very useful when you ask questions, especially if you use a paper questionnaire. You could ask questions like, I found this game to be, and then this thing we call a Likert scale. Excellent, good, average, fair, poor. Or scale of 1 to 10. 1 being terrible and 10 being awesome. That's a Likert scale. We use Likert scales to measure opinions of things like this all the time, including the opinion of what is fun? Another version of a Likert scale could be rate this game on a scale of 1 to 10, as I just said. Or another Likert scale, this game left me blank satisfied, where you would say totally satisfied, mostly satisfied, somewhat satisfied, a little satisfied, or not at all satisfied. That is another example of a Likert scale. If you are asked about a Likert scale on a test or quiz, I hope you recognize it. All right, that's it for this week. Next week, we have a very exciting project in lab. In the lecture, we're going to talk about prototyping games. There are various different ways of doing it, including physical prototyping. And in the lab, we're going to get out the toy box and do some physical game prototyping with toys. So. Until next week, this is Mike Substelny for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College.